the South Dakota Healthcare Coalition is um, uh, is uh, and we have a number of members. We have one coalition here in South Dakota. Um, so a lot of states have multiple coalitions. Um, we have one coalition with four chapters, but we have one overarching set of leadership. And there are four chapters. We have a chapter in the Black Hills, um, a chapter in the Glacial Lakes, which is I, I, I'll I'll do it by direction. So Black Hills is west, Glacial Lakes is north, South Central is south, obviously, and then the Sioux Empire region is the east side of the state, or what I lovingly refer to as the east coast of South Dakota. <laughs> um, and this um, fireside chat was something that we started um, about, I, I guess. Um, last budget period and we just decided that I'd always wanted to do uh, a, a live kind of thing with uh, with experts from across the country and we've had a lot of really good conversations and a lot you know and it basically is um, I don't call it a podcast or a webinar it's kind of a pot and R um, and <laughs> I like and it so you know and basically it's kind of like a free uh, a free discussion um, on whatever it is that is um, you know, is your passion at the time, um, you know, when priorities change and preparedness changes and so on. So um, just everybody, James Robinson is the chief of um, Thompson Valley EMS in Loveland, Colorado. Um, James and I met, I got that right, right? Yes, sir. Okay. James and I met um, on the National Advisory Committee on Seniors and Disasters, um, a committee that I chair. It's an ASPR committee that's uh, I guess congressionally um, funded, or or it's a congressional. We report back to Congress at some point, um, and uh, and so James and I are uh, with EMS backgrounds. Look at things, you know, slightly different from everybody else um, in there. And I asked James to join us today and and talk about EMS. And we are um, in our coalition. We're really trying to enhance um, our EMS membership. Um, and so I want to start out, I have a couple of, like you and I emailed back and forth yesterday, and I, I have a couple of things that, you know, we could talk about, um, but I wanted to, I wanted you to tell me a little bit about you or tell our group a little bit about you and Thompson Valley EMS. Um, and then we'll kind of get, we'll kind of dig into some, um, wherever we go, we go kind of topics. Okay. Um, uh, well, first, let me just say, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I always like these kind, this is a great format. I like having conversations with people as opposed to lecturing and things like that. Um, I think we get a lot more out of it mutually that way. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I'm James Robinson. My, I'm an EMS guy. Um, I've been in EMS since 1989. Started out as a volunteer EMT uh, for a local ambulance service in north suburbs of Denver. Um, and did that for a few years, um, decided because I was spending so much time in the, uh, at the ambulance barn that I, I probably ought to get a job doing it um, <laughs> instead of volunteering. Um, so I got a job working for us for a private ambulance company. Didn't really know much about, you know, the field at all at that time. And then uh, I worked there for a couple of years, got pushed to go to paramedic school because I had some affinity for the work and some aptitude in it and went to paramedic school and then worked, um, continued to pay off my um, my volunteer agency for sending me to P school and then uh, worked for that private for a couple of years. And then I applied for a job with the city and county of Denver paramedics and had a 26 year career uh, working for the Denver paramedic division. Um, and uh, retired there in 2019 as the, um, the operations chief. So I ran that 911 system for the city and county of Denver for the last 15 years of my career, um, overseeing kind of all aspects of 911 service delivery for the city and in, including the airport and you know all field EMS operations, special events, um, dignitary protection, kind of all the things that along with you know a, a large EMS agency and then um, was approached by a friend of mine who was wanted to retire from up here in Thompson Valley um, I did a couple of year stint in uh, working in senior living actually as uh, doing preparedness and 
um, safety and preparedness for a senior living company that had 50 senior living communities in 10 states. So I did that for a couple of years and then uh, and then got recruited to uh, to Thompson Valley to be the chief up here. And this is one of the places that I've always really appreciated about Colorado because of the the model, the governance model here. So so that's kind of where I came from. Um, and then you had a follow on to that too, Greg. I had a what? I'm sorry. I thought you had a follow on to that and tell me about you and then you I'll let you drive from there. That's oh, my okay. background. I also did, um, you know, I've, I've been an EMS guy and like national policy level stuff and local and state level policy work too on the EMS side of things. Um, and and uh, was the past president of the International Association of EMS Chiefs. So I do have kind of a well-rounded perspective on EMS from a big picture perspective down to actually running a local agency. Sounds good. And I'll give you the I'll give you the 30 second, Greg, because all these people get bored of faith. They're tired of hearing of me. Um, uh, we have very similar backgrounds. I started out as a, a volunteer fire EMS guy on Long Island um, it, uh, right around the same time, 1988, um, 1989. And um, I was I was actually in an engine company, but I ran a lot of EMS calls. Um, and I worked my way up from EMT and on um, on Long Island, they have a EMT, uh, advanced EMT. Um, mm -hmm. They call it like they, they call that level. That's kind of like the gray area level across the country. Some people call them intermediates. Some people call them advanced EMTs um, and so on. And then I went from EMT to AEMT to paramedic. Um, and um, I was the first paramedic in the Massapequa Fire Department. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yes, I was like, I, I was kind of like, I was the the groundbreaking paramedic that everybody hated because I was an engine company officer who went on more ambulance calls than most of the ambulance people. Um, and so I, like like you, I decided to make some money doing it and I became a paramedic in New York City. Um, and then I went on to run the paramedic program at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. Oh, wow. where I was for um, from 95 to uh, the time I moved here. Um, and so at the same time, you know, we were doing a lot of the non Luger preparedness grants. Yeah. 9-11 uh, happened and we were the closest trauma center. Oh, wow. Um, I was um, one of one of eight paramedics who were on the regional EMS advisory committee in New York City. Um, so there's like municipal volunteer, voluntary and um, and um, uh, proprietary ambulance services in New York City, and there were two representatives from each one of those services, and we worked with uh, with all of the REMAC physicians and the mm. state and the city on creating protocols and testing and paramedic certifications and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, after 9-11, I came out to South Dakota to do a presentation, and they wouldn't leave, let me leave, so here I am. Um, mm. And, you know, and life changed a little bit. And now, you know, I, I was with the Sanford Health for 16, 17 years. Um, and then the opportunity came up with the Healthcare Coalition. Um, there's a couple of folks on that are the founding members of the Healthcare Coalition here. Um, uh, and um, so we, we call it the Mount Rushmore of the coalition. Um, nice. Us old guys who have been around a long time, who have, um, who have kind of seen the changes. And then we became a 501c3 a couple of years ago. And COVID came um, and slowed everything down, and now we're on the fast track to um, to really be a template for what our other healthcare coalitions are like. And this particular thing is one of the uh, one of our brainchilds. You know, this fireside chat. Like, let's bring experts in. Let's let's talk about what's going on around the country um, and see what other people are doing. Um, and I. One of the things that I have, and we'll, we'll, this will kind of drive our first discussion. One of the things that that I have been doing is studying um, response to MCIs um, and where EMS actually fits in the world. So I created a, an argument in Anaheim at the National Healthcare Preparedness Coalition Preparedness Conference that EMS is considered first responders, but we're really the first responding healthcare professionals at a disaster or in a, in a, in a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, but the the way we are categorized puts us out there with fire, fire and law enforcement, but we operate entirely differently. 
Um, and when it comes to planning and exercises and things like that, um, EMS kind of gets left out of a lot of that stuff because the fire department's drilling and unless you're a fire-based EMS, um, you are, um, you're really not in it. And the hospitals talk about EMS, like, you know, the, um, the, the CEO is like, oh, I got to decompress 30, 40 people. Um, I'll, EMS will do that for us. What's the next objective in our, in the drill? You know, so we just, we just decompress 30 people. Now we have all this room. Um, and the reality of it is, you know, in some areas, particularly here in rural South Dakota, decompressing 30 people could take a week. Um, and so with that, one of our, one of our challenges is kind of change, uh, trying to create a paradigm shift where EMS is really more embraced by healthcare here in South Dakota, um, actively involved in drills. Um, and and it, it's been a challenge. So I guess my first question is, what are some of the biggest challenges you see um, as, a, as an EMS chief in making EMS more, uh, more healthcare centric um, rather than first responder centric. And I know that there are a lot of people say, well, that they are both, but technically, like when I explain that, that, that quagmire that we're in, um, it, it does create a couple of challenges. Um, that's a, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff embedded in that question. And, um, so I think, you know, one of the differences that doing some um, national level policy stuff, one of the things that I got to do um, in the EMS Chiefs Association was um, we had a really strong partnership with the Canadians and the EMS Chiefs of Canada. And since you're closer to them than I am, um, you know, I imagine that there's probably even potentially more opportunity there. But but what what I noticed that was different between the United States and Canada is that it um, EMS is firmly and unambiguously part of the healthcare system in Ca in Canada. Um, so even though we deploy, to your point, you know, we deploy resources similar to our partners in, you know, the public safety realm, um, we are kind of uh, we are kind of straddling a bunch of different lines there, and we're straddling sort of the public health line straddling the public safety line and the emergency response community. We're part of the healthcare system, so we have that piece. And then we're also part of kind of the, um, you know, public health, public safety, the medical and the medical system, and then sort of an emergency management. We have emergency management roles too. And so I think, um, you know, I think those are, those make it challenging for sure. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do there. Um, I, you know, I think if you boil it down fundamentally, the the way that you, I think we kind of separate ourselves out is is we know what, that what we're doing is providing healthcare. We're providing medical care outside of the walls of a facility. Um, and I think as EMS fundamentally, and I, and I think you would probably agree with me on this, that one of the things that we're good at is being problem solvers. And, you know, and, and, and you see that with our partners in public safety who call us when they get to the end of, you know, kind of as we act for patients as sort of help me solve a problem that I've run out of resources to solve uh, a medical resource problem. Um, our, I think our partners in public safety call us when they run out of their capacity to solve whatever problem. And they're like, just call the paramedics. They'll figure out what to do with this person. And, 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 you know, that's a great, it's a great sort of skill set to have. Uh, um, but it's also sometimes our worst enemy, like we're our own worst enemy, because we're willing to take on problems that without funding or without um, support or whatever, and just do it. And, and, and that stretches us thin. And so I think um, what, you know, what you said about, uh, um, you know, the hospitals, We'll just say, oh, EMS will do that for us. You know, I think the problem for us is that most often we will, <laughs> we will do that, <laughs> whether we have the resources or not. And so, so I think participating in entities like the Healthcare Coalition is our opportunity to have a conversation with our other partners about what things can we do and what things can't we do. Um, because and I've had that conversation that you mentioned about decompressing a facility over and over and over. 
and I was one of the founding members of our healthcare coalition in in the Denver metro area, and it's a ten county, ten counties uh, comprise that that particular all hazard region in the state of Colorado. So, the co our state's divided up into nine all hazard regions, um, and that those are kind of funded through Homeland Security funding. Um, that the, and the grants that come out of each of those. And, and so there used to be 32 healthcare coalitions in Colorado, and they were very small, they were very sort of localized. And then, uh, and as we started talking about how can we maximize the benefit of using the HPP dollars and some of the FEP dollars to, um, to, to create a little bit more uh, action in each of the healthcare coalitions, what we we as a group decided that we were going to consolidate all of the healthcare coalitions into to mirroring those nine all hazard regions that are primarily funded through uh, DHS dollars. Mm -hmm. And so, by aligning those funding streams, it gave us an opportunity to to use different pots of money for different projects depending on sort of their focus. And so, the the North Central Healthcare Coalition is the one that is most of the Denver metro area. And in ours, you know, we, we um, in, in that group, I had the conversations with the hospital CEOs and other folks on the preparedness side uh, about here's the things that we can do. And then a lot of times I, I would go to meetings and, and I would just do, I'm going to put this up so you can see it. I would I would go to these planning meetings and I would create a sign like this, and and that's, that might be backwards, but it says no. <laughs> and so so when people would say things like we're gonna have EMS is gonna decompress our hospital, I'd just go like that, and just say no, we're not gonna do that because whatever is neat, whatever has created the situation that requires you to decompress your hospital is something that we're dealing with currently in the field. So, so you're, we can't break away from that, nor can we really break away. And I don't know how it is there, but you know, because of the funding models for EMS and um, you know, on this sort of reimbursement based model, um, everyone's sort of forced to live on their margin. Um, in terms of what resources you can mount on a daily basis. And that's one of the reasons I came to Thompson Valley is because of the funding model and the governance model here. This is a, we're a special district. So we're a governmental entity that has tax funding for readiness. Um, and and I, it's the only place I've worked that has that. And so we have tax funding plus reimbursement. So we have the readiness costs are paid for. We are, we actually, have about 40 percent of our budget is tax funding and the rest is reimbursement so typically you know our funding is not our biggest issue it's some of the i'm sure some of the folks on the call here are struggling with the same thing which is recruitment and retention um so anyway that's i i think um that's that's sort of high level where I think we live. And then I think on the preparedness side, you know, the other thing that we in EMS are pretty bad about is lamenting the fact that we're not invited. We didn't get invited to that conversation. We weren't part of the discussion. People didn't think about us. And some of that is, um, frankly, it's whining on our part. You know, like one of my, one of my good friends and mentors used to tell me all the time, the world's run by those who show up, buddy. So you should probably start showing up. And, and I think he was right. And, you know, as I've, as, as I've tried to live by that, um, in our healthcare coalition, I've made sure I showed up and I made sure I showed up at, at the Homeland Security meetings and, you know, and, and all of the different planning venues to advocate not only for my discipline, but to make, to come up with something that's going to work on game day. Um, because to your point, Greg, if you if the hospital is depending on you to evacuate patients, and I know that I'm not going to be available to do that, then the plan's built on sand. You know, the the foundation of that plan's built on sand. So we want to make sure that we're 
you know, we're showing up when we say we're going to be there, that we're going to be there, that people can rely on it. And, and then we're also managing the expectations for folks that have, have unrealistic ones, um, you know, in their own planning efforts. And, you know, I think part of um, the, you know, all these excellent points, and I think part of um, showing up is also feeling welcome. Um, and we have we have struggled. Um, I think we're doing better. Uh, I, I guess the EMS people on the on the call can can judge that better. But I think we're doing better in acknowledging um, that you know EMS is a key partner. We've had I mean last last month's um, fireside chat was uh, a presentation on. It was a little more formal, um, standard. It, it kind of well, anyway. Um, was about paramedic injuries um, and fatalities and things like that. And we're trying to bring more EMS-centric uh, information into the coalition. Even our conference this year, um, it, which is in two weeks, um, pl I'll plug that for all the members who have not yet registered. We run a free conference every year, emergency management conference, and we're bringing in Ryan Greenberg. He's the, he, the state director wow. of EMS, and he does... A leadership academy at EMS One every year. Um, he's a friend of mine. I know is Ryan. Ryan, I know Ryan is an old well. paramedic student. Yeah, great guy. Um, I love Ryan. He's a great guy, and he has, you know, he has excelled in really bringing EMS to the front lines. Um, and he's coming in to do um, th this leadership academy for healthcare and EMS providers. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also going to talk about. Um, he's doing a presentation in the conference about EMS leadership, um, and he has this whole concept, you probably know, of, you know, we have these field training officers in EMS, but we don't have leadership training officers, and there's a big difference mm -hmm. between between being an FTO and teaching leaders how to lead, um, yeah. and, you know, and what do we do? We, you know, we, we learned about, just, when I became an EMS supervisor, there was nobody there giving me a book. <laughs> Um, no. saying here's how it works it's like having a kid you know there's no there's no directions when the baby's born and there's no directions when um when you know when you become an ems supervisor and you've got you know you've got you know i had 80 paramedics under me at saint vincent's and half of them were my preceptors <laughs> um and and it's so that transition yeah where, you know you've got these ancient paramedics who and they're all at you at the same time um but one of the things that um, that we're trying to do is we've got Rob Luckritz also from Austin Travis County coming up. I know to Rob. Too. About, he's going to talk about uh, when he was in Jersey, a uh, a police officer who was assassinated um, at a um, at I believe it was a Walmart or something, and how everybody responded in to an unsafe scene, um, and all of the ramifications of responding to a scene like that and the the long-term impacts and stuff like that so what we're looking to do is you know you can have um you can have presentations about um you know ekgs and medications and things like that that you would see at a normal uh, ems conference or or even a refresher but we're looking to look to go on to the the fringes um and to bring information in that is essential to survival of ems folks um, and but also at the same time, go a little EMS heavy on our conference this year. So I got got people going. Is this an emergency management conference or is it an EMS conference? I'm like, <laughs> it's all one in the same. Um, yeah. You know, if you if you try to the problem that we that we run into all the time is, and you know this, um, we are as first responders, um, very very protective of our toys in the sandbox. Um, and we need to take those barriers down and say, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, the one thing that I saw um, when 9-11 when happened was all the politics that occurred between the fire department EMS guys and the hospital-based EMS guys, all that went away. And we were driving each other's ambulances and backing each other up. And this FDNY paramedic hooked up with this hospital paramedic and created a new crew. Um, you know, and we, like you said earlier, we are, we are expert at making things happen. Yeah. Um, we we are we're like the um the MacGyvers for those of you who are older, mm -hmm. the MacGyvers of the first responder world. And um so what we're trying to do 
uh, is, is find a way to find a way. Um, and one of the things, one of the things that, um, that no sign um, hits home because I've been having conversations um, and we can, this could be our next topic. I've been having conversations with, um, with coalition folks from across the country. I, you know, I network all the time. Um, and I've been having a conversation recently with a gal named Melissa Rose from Central Ohio, who's going to be doing a fireside chat with us specifically on the, 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 re, the mercy exercise and the one stopping point where we all seem to be able to find beds, but we can't find the transportation assets to get the people from point A to point B. So, and, and I guess my, my next question is, is what is, what has been your role, if any, have you been invited to participate within those mercy exercises? And, and if not, um, how do we, how do we make that happen? But if you have, like, how have you managed to find ways to do things and to get patients from point A to point B? Mm. Well, I've had, I've participated in a lot of those types of exercises, a lot of the NDMS, um, patient movement stuff too. And, um, because we had an international airport here and, and lots of NDMS hospitals on the receiving side. So a lot of the transportation challenges and those are getting people from the airport to receiving facilities. And, but I think on, but on, on the bigger picture sorts of disaster exercises like those, um, there, you know, numerous iterations of those types of scenarios. And what I, what I realized most of all is that in, in EMS, you know, a lot of the things that work well in our public safety partners, sorts of armamentarium for mutual aid and for helping each other don't work the same way for us. And, and to your point, you know, we're, we have, other than our deployment model, we're really different than the other emergency services that operate in the field. Um, and, and we are a healthcare entity. And I think on the, on the, um, the competition between private EMS providers sometimes is a barrier to coordinating those types of transport uh, or patient movement types of things. And in my experience, I think the probably um, it's the, another one of my mentors said, you know, I, I, I want to be part of the planning more than part of the plan. And a lot of the times people write us into their plans without actually talking to us. And, and there's some structural problems that kind of lead to that. I think that lend, uh, that lend themselves to, to that being the case. And, and, you know, structurally from the federal level down, if you think about, I mean, and being an emergency management guy, you'll, this will resonate with you for sure. Um, but the, you know, the, if you follow the money, um, the, the money that comes through preparedness funds tends to drive the structure in a lot of cases. So the, the money comes from the feds, it gets passed through to the states and those, whatever department the money comes from at the federal level ends up aligning with whatever department that is at the state level, which translates down to the counties or whatever other sub-governmental entities. And, and because of that, I think, um, you know, the, these different pots of money end up driving some of the, you know, some of the agendas. And obviously, you know, with the require, grant requirements for things um, tend to, to drive some of those conversations. When I think when we have, um, you know, from the EMS side, we don't have a home at the federal level. So there is no agency at the federal level that has primacy over EMS. And, and some of this, I think, is because we're, you know, we're not really, uh, we're relatively young. I mean, we're talking 50 years now of organized EMS, really. Um, and we don't have a federal advocate or a policy portal of entry at the federal level to drive some of those advocacy discussions about funding and things like that. So what that structure lends itself to the discord at the local level, I think too, because it, as locals try to emulate those structures, 
um, to, to facilitate the pass through of dollars, um, what you end up with at the local level is something that, you know, aligns with that. And when you have, and then you add the private, the private for-profit entities into that conversation too. Now you have people that are acting, you know, for their own motives, um, you know, organizational motives. And so the biggest struggle that I've seen with those big exercises is the coordination of, of the resources. And so in, at, in EMS, what's different is the governmental entities don't own the majority of the surge capacity because the surge capacity for EMS lives in the private sector um, because they're doing the interfacility transports and they have resources that are that could be made available for um, response to a, a crisis um, by just by, by by foregoing the patient the non-emergency patient movement stuff and because the the local jurisdictions don't own the resources it makes it difficult to plan and it makes it difficult to say this is what we can mount on a daily basis yeah and you know we have a a transportation plan and, um, you know, you, you're with the funding. Um, it just, what, what resonated with me, um, is the, is the disparate amount of money that goes to, you know, to different agencies. So, so for example, I know in New York city, there's a controller's office has been come down on FDNY several, uh, audits in a row because, out of the out of their preparedness funding and their their budgets, um, EMS does eighty five percent of the call volume and getting gets fifteen percent of the budget. Um, yeah, and it's been like that for um, for years since I since I've been there. That most of the money goes to the what they call the suppression mm -hmm. side and not not the EMS side. Um, so it it puts EMS in a in a position. Um, and I think that's standard across the board in a position that th there's never enough money to provide the type of resources or have the resources um, to, to quote unquote, um, a, a term that I heard when I moved here to, you know, to build the church for Easter kind of thing. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I came here and I was like, I was used to being able to get on the radio and ask for, you know, 10 ALS and 10 BLS. And within 15 minutes, I'd have them all on scene. And then I came here and they're like, well, we don't even have 20 ambulances in the city of Sioux Falls. And I'm like, well, we need more. And they're like, well, no, you don't build the church for Easter. The call volume is this. And I was like, well, what, you know, what's the biggest event? Um, and how many people come to it? And at the time, it was um, a Christian music festival that was held within the city limits. Um, that brought like 30, 40,000 people over the, over the weekend. And you have an EMS system that has, you know, 12, 15 ambulances, three of mm -hmm. which are on the street and the rest are on, on call. Um, and I asked about leapfrogging and mutual aid and all of that. And, and it was, um, it, it wasn't necessarily um, solidified is a good word. Um, and I, I, all I kept saying was, listen, you have all these small towns and they all have two ambulances each. Pull all those ambulances and park an ambulance on the interstate between them and have them cover 911. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't really my role. Um, I, I wrote, uh, when I first came here, I wrote the MCI plan for the city of Sioux Falls as a, um, a, almost as a consulting, a free consulting thing um, because of my role in New York City um, and, yeah. and kind of figuring that out. Um, but, you know, the, the resources are missing um, in, a, in the ability to do that and a really solid model for, um, for relocation of resources is, is absent in a lot of rural states, I think. Um, and I, and I, I always wonder, like, um, one of the things that, all right, so I'll, I'll just roll right into my next pet peeve. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. Cause I, I tried to flip the tables a little bit at Anaheim with this. Um, and I always put that, I always put my first slide is like, I'm not really here to piss you off, but I probably will. Um, and <laughs> I love it. And I'm like, you know, is anybody here as an emergency manager, anybody here from, um, uh, you know, 
from this state because this state has a creepy law that doesn't allow the healthcare coalitions to be operational um, and so on. But anyway, um, you know, we look at we look at EMS branch operations and MCIs. Um, and the, what what got this under my skin was through my master's training and 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 on, I've been studying MCIs, like large scale events across the world. Um, and in each and every event, the EMS branch, as laid out in the National Incident Management System and Incident Command, never ever happens um, because no. of the way we operate. And and my argument has always been, you know. We and this goes back to why we don't necessarily fit with the rest of the first responders um, is that we operate totally differently, and it's it's completely outside of my scope of even comprehension. If you expect me to pull my ambulance up and lay out different colored tarps um, <laughs> and take forty five minutes while everyone's rushing, um, and we. The, the, the tenant, the number one tenet of NIMS is don't change what you do every day, but we throw this wrench um, in the gears of EMS operations by saying, no, you have to have an EMS branch, and it fails every time. It, it failed on 9-11. It failed in Las Vegas. It failed in, um, in Oklahoma City. It has failed over and over again, and out of the country, in Madrid and in, in um, Tokyo. Yeah. We rush our ambulances because where the healthcare experts, where the first ones arriving, and we stuff them in and we bring them to the hospital. And we've had a conversation um, a while ago on this same chat um, about the Israeli model where they move the disaster to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you a scenario and I'm gonna ask you your opinion. Um, about 10 years ago, and I don't know if Kathy is on, but um, in Madison, South Dakota, which is north of here, pretty rural. Um, we had a bus, of a tour bus of 76 uh, senior folks heading to a casino that got clipped by a car and flipped. Um, and oh, they all wow. ended up in, in the middle of a, you know, in the middle of a rural area. Um, and there were helicopters coming and ambulances coming. But basically, the, the EMS service had a couple ambulances. Um, and what wound up happening was basically almost everyone got transported to the local critical access hospital. Um, and at first, you know, being, you know, the big quote, New York City guy, I was like, oh my God, that's horrible. Like, why did they do that? They overwhelmed the hospital. But as you start looking at the way these models work, it makes perfect sense because the hospital is a solid facility that has way more resources. Even though they'd be overwhelmed, they're less overwhelmed than EMS. So I guess my question is, is there a um, opportunity to shift the paradigm from making an expectation that we're going to give you this really, this really pretty multicolored mat set um, <laughs> and say, no, we want to train you. We want to be advocates of what you're, you're capable of and change that model, especially piloting it maybe in rural areas where we do move the people off the scene to the hospital and the hospital becomes the EMS branch per se, the, you know, the, the triage zone. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, wow, there's lots of stuff in, in that one too. Um, you know, I, I share your disdain for the mats, <laughs> the different colored <laughs> mats. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. And, but, but I think, you know, I think part of where that comes from is um, it doesn't really come from EMS people. It comes from our partners in the fire service and, and in law enforcement to some degree. And one of the things that I think is different about us fundamentally as the practitioners is sort of the, the recognizing that things are going to always change and, and that you have to be more adaptable. And I think one of the things about EMS people generally is that we're pretty adaptable. Um, to changing situations um, because patients change right in front of you all the time. So I think the the mats represent trying to impose control systems on things that you can't really control. And I like to tell my team here, you know, like there's things that you can control and things that you can't. And, um, you know, you can't really control the ocean. So you should try, probably learn how to surf on it. 
<laughs> instead of getting smashed by it into the reef. Um, and so, you know, I think what we've strived for and, and my team is being adaptable to the cha to changing situations and that if you, if you have rigid plans, and this is one of the problems fundamentally with a lot of plans is they don't anticipate that things are going to change. And you try to impose this, you, you start out with your, your, your plan and, you know, to quote, I can't remember which, which general it was, but that talked about plans never really surviving first contact with the enemy. Um, you know, that's, I think that's true. And you kind of have to go into these things with a more open mind about the, you know, the need to be scalable and adaptable. As far as the, the moving the, um, you know, the MCI to the hospital, I think, uh, you know, they're on the, I'm familiar with the Israeli model and I have some good colleagues from Israel, from um, Megid David Adam. And, and uh, they, you know, I think that it's not a really a, um, an apples to apples comparison with anything we have in the United States because they kind of engineer the whole process differently. Um, you know, the, they have a higher degree of individual preparedness uh, as a society than we do. Um, they have, they encourage, you know, where in the United States we'll take a crime scene and throw, get there quickly, put up the barriers, throw up the crime scene tape and say, you stay over there and we'll, this prof us professionals will take care of the stuff inside this yellow crime scene tape. Well, in, in Israel, they encourage anybody who shows up that has a skill to, to be part of the response. And, that, and I think, um, you know, that's, a, a, that's different than here um, because of tort law and other things. Um, but I also think that the hospitals are set up for that too, because they, you know, we build hospitals for opulence and to attract people, especially private ones. You know, we have the, the beautiful glass entryway foyers and, and things like that in, in our hospitals. And they build, you know, decon showers into the, into the tile, into the, you know, the drop roofs um, and um, extra oxygen, you know, extra oxygen ports and all that, you know, water piping and stuff so that they can expand their hospital into an in, in, into a larger treatment areas where we don't really do a lot of that. Um, and so I think, while I think it's, it's, an, it's a great goal, um, I don't think we're there yet. But as far as, to your point about managing the incident at the hospital, the rural example I think is spot on. And what I think is an opportunity for us and healthcare coalitions are probably the right place to have these conversations is rather than like, once we move all those people off of the scene, excuse me, how can we as EMS help the hospitals do that secondary triage and coordinate the, the movement of those patients in an organized fashion? And I think you saw that a little bit with the, um, the Las Vegas example that you mentioned, where they were starting to send companies to the hospitals to keep to do triage in the parking lot so that, you know, they, they were helping the hospitals sort of maximize their limited surgical resources. And I think that's a good model. That's something that we need to, to we need to plan that we need to you know, uh, um, evaluate that and exercise that um, and think of a little bit differently about what our role might be and that we might be doing triage at, at the, uh, at the e ER, you know, doorstep. And, and particularly with that, mo that particular incident, which the response was sort of a self-organized thing. It was an organically self-organizing response. Um, where the Uber drivers and people with pickup trucks are taking people to the hospital. And, you know, I think that's probably going to happen more often. Well, and that's, that was one of the things that, um, uh, that um, I have a, I have a friend who is a physician. We, she used to be the, um, 
the chair of the training and ed committee in, in New York City, Heidi Cordy. And um, she is now up in Albany Medical Center. Um, and she's also part of the uh, Academy of Disaster Medicine. Every time Heidi calls, I know I'm getting myself into some new bizarre project that she's, awesome. that she's, um, she's dragging me into. Um, but we were talking about after Las Vegas. So when you read the um, when you read the after action report um, for Las Vegas, you know, they, it, say, it states that they tried to set up an EMS branch twice and failed both times. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that was because the assets really weren't there and the people weren't paying, weren't listening. Um, and because of all the ensuing panic and rumors. So, you know, that there were bombs in this in this casino and there was a shooter here and a shooter there. And a lot of it was based on echoes and, and things like that. We had a very, very similar experiences during 9-11 where the rumors were rampant about not only what was occurring across the country. Like if you were if you were on the ground there, you had heard about probably a dozen different things that didn't really happen. Like, you know, the Space Needle in Seattle was down and the Washington Mall was on fire. And, you know, and this, like all these rumors that there were car bombs going off all over lower Manhattan. Um, and none of that, none of that existed. And so a lot of the rumor control that creates panic in the moment blocks um, blocks a lot of that. But, um, you know, the the way, again, we operate, people see an ambulance and um and they run at it um and you know and that's it they're like and they're they're help us um and so you know Heidi and I were having this conversation about stop the bleed um and we were like what if we took it another step because people are going to do it anyway let's start as an initiative called start the truck um and if you're going to take if you're going to be that person who's going to load up your pickup truck or steal a pickup truck to load up to bring <laughs> people to the hospital, at least know what you're doing. You know, when you ask Siri, um, don't say, where's the closest hospital? Say, where's the closest trauma center? Um, like there, these little nuances. We did a conference here um, and we had Vegas. We had, it was called Perspectives. And we had a hot, we had hospital people, we had EMS people um, and so on. Um, and, we talked and we had a victim, somebody who was a, a patient who got shot. He lived here. Um, he was down for the concert and he got shot in the leg. And so he was mm -hmm. all um, he was he was a little salty about the fact that he was shot and he sat on the floor of an emergency room <laughs> in the waiting room for hours. Um, and and he wanted to say something about that at our conference. And then as he listened to the pandemonium that was described not only by uh, EMS providers, but by the hospital providers, we did a we did a panel. We usually do a panel discussion at our conference and bring everybody together at the end and say, okay, what have you learned? And it's the old um, Simpsons things. What have we learned? Um, and um, so he was like, he was taken aback by the amount of, um, resilience that it took for both EMS and healthcare to continue operations under such pressure. And he said, I came in here totally, totally irritated with the way everything went. And I, he goes, I probably learned more than anybody at this conference today wow. uh, about why I sat on that floor bleeding for, you know, several hours because, because of, of the circumstances that that arise but i guess the question is or the or the, the comment is is the public like the israeli model like you said the public does get involved mm -hmm. um they they do get involved so maybe part of our transition is to train them how to be involved better so like we we've got this yeah. so something that started out as a joke between heidi and i right after the las vegas thing is like well start the truck you know and let's get but, you know, it could be an initiative that teaches people, like, here are some of the, the, the you know, five things you need to know or three things you need to know in the mm -hmm. middle of a mass event where, where chaos is taking over and, and how, you control, how you control that chaos. Um, because people are going to want to be involved. And mm -hmm. in all the research I've done, and, and I still haven't come up with the answer, I have a theory, 
um, but I, I don't have the answer. I, I don't really know is that in every event, and I've, I've studied, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 MCIs, um, in every event, everybody winds up at the closest hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the escapees all drive themselves to the closest hospitals and EMS transports to the closest hospital, even though our plans might say, go further out. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's because of the way our brains react um, in, in crisis where we have amygdala hijack and we go into fight or flight mm -hmm. and we are continually trained. Um, this is my theory, closest appropriate hospital. Yeah. Um, and our brain is just saying the closest appropriate hospital is the closest hospital. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, for turnaround times or just where we're in the same mode as um as everybody else so i think that um uh, that that is one of the one of the issues that we have on um, maybe in rural areas the closest hospital is the only hospital but in larger right. areas it has occurred time and time and time again and the only place it didn't really happen was boston for the marathon buying because they were already set up for an mci they already had their mats out okay yeah. Yeah. So if the mats are out like yeah. the system works but you don't have the 45 minutes to get the mats out and uh, I was talking to Joe O'Hare from Boston. He spoke at our conference and he was still, he was like, you know, Boston strong, like we're the best. And I told him, I said, you know, I have a, I have a major amount of respect for Boston EMS. I think they're one of the best EMS systems in the country. Um, I told him not quite as good as New York city, but um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're all our fans of our own agencies, but I think Boston is um, one of the, one of the finest EMS systems in the country, along with Denver paramedics. Um, and Austin, Travis County, I think those are the, when you think about some of the best EMS systems, those are the ones that come to mind. Um, but, but I think, you know, these paradigm shifts, like how does, I, you know, or maybe we can end with this, how does EMS engage the public to be less of a, I wonder what to say nuisance, but less of a barrier and obstruction and more of an, you know, more of a, of a resource. Uh, I think it's, I think that's a great, that's a great challenge for us. And I, you know, and I don't, I don't know if it's going to be completely driven by us and EMS. Um, I think there, there are pieces that we have to bring to that puzzle, but I think my, my personal feeling is that we got to get back to something about um, more like the sort of civil defense posture that we had, like when you and I were kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that, you know, where you're doing, where you're learning about how to manage, um, re, you know, manage emergencies a little bit, where they're teaching that as curriculum in school, um, because I don't think we have that, that sort of focus. And, and one thing I love about being out here in the West is culturally, I think as a culturally, people in the Western United States are pretty self-sufficient people. Um, and I think, but I don't think that's necessarily the sort of the common cultural thread across the entire country. And, and I think as a country, we have to be less, um, we, we, we have to adopt this, like, we're not going to be a victim kind of a posture, I think. And, and how can we help each other and help our neighbors is the way that I think we get there. And, and I'm sure you've had similar experiences in your EMS career. Career, but but I've seen you know pretty heroic acts from bystanders yeah. um, throughout throughout my career. And what I learned, I think, at least anecdotally, is that as long as you know if people have some kind of training to draw from in that time of need, they don't hesitate to act. In fact, a lot of people will do it even if they don't have any training. They like, and I think we have some genetic predisposition to want to help other people. And, and so I, you know, a lot of folks, um, you know, we have relative levels of amygdala hijack to use your term, but, you know, in, in emergencies, but a lot of bystanders are glad to jump in and help either if they have some kind of training or if you give them clear direction and, and, um, and, and then I've never seen anybody really hesitate to help in those situations. Um, it, as long as, as I've at least remained calm and said, Hey, I need your help. Can you do this? 
Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're running around screaming, then all hope's lost. But but uh, but I think um, I think that's the way we get there, Greg. Is we we kind of get back to um, you know talking about these things in school. We you know one of the things we're doing here in, at Thompson Valley is we've established a um, a partnership with our local school district, and so we're and every sophomore in high school gets trained on CPR and AED use and in stop the bleed. And they've set aside time for us to do that. And, and that's a that's a big commitment from what I learned because I tried to do that in Denver. And Denver Public School says, oh yeah, every, you know, every minute of curriculum time is gold and we can't set aside, you know, three or four hours for you to do that. But here they have up here in, in Northern Colorado. Um, they have set aside that time. So we're, we're training every student coming out of high school is, has CPR training, AED training, and, and stop the bleed training. And I think that's the way that you sort of raise that, that baseline level of preparedness as a country as by doing things like that. And those are things we can bring to that, you know, to the party, but I, and, but I'm sure there are other things, you know, on the fire safety side and, probably some of that sort of situational awareness training on the law enforcement side um, and, you know, and other, I think, I think it's also probably a good idea to include some sort of fundamental understanding of what emergency management does too, because I think people have unrealistic expectations of how fast, you know, the federal response is going to be to anything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and despite the fact that our, our, or brothers and sisters in FEMA have been telling people, you know, make a plan and have a kit and plan to take care of yourself for 72 hours. Nobody does that. You know, very few people do that, you know. So I think that's how we raise the posture. And I think that, you know, with, with FEMA, like I've always, I've always had these conversations, even, you know, um, after 9-11, it was different for 9-11 because, you know, that, that event was just so concentrated into that you know mm -hmm. 20 acre area or whatever it was and then Katrina happened um and right you know and it's a totally different set of um of circumstances with resource management where you know you could bring resources right up to the edge of ground zero but you know New Orleans was hundreds of square miles of devastation right um and FEMA you know, people think FEMA comes in the night after the event, shakes out the blanket and everything is perfect the next day, you know, yeah. um, and 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 until that mindset changes um, and, and we and we create a mindset that is, listen, we're responsible for our own our own survival for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that's kind of what the NACSD, what we're working on with the NACSD, and and you know, yeah. and I know you've seen you've seen the draft document, um, and I had a, the cop, the number one thing that I brought to the table when I had my meeting with with Maxine on that was the second question asked for asked was how do we get the information? Like we have all those great recommendations, but how does it get into the home of the seventy five year old couple? And that's what I've been. You've heard me go on and on and on about yeah. trying tying us together with children in disasters and individuals with disabilities. Yeah. Um, and because it's all those people live in the same place. Um, and I said, Maxine, that's the, that is the question is how do we get the information? In? And I think it, I think it applies here as well um, is that we need to get to the end user mm -hmm. um, and let them know that, you know, yes, help is on the way, but it may not come for, quite a while and that's what FEMA has been saying all along you need a kit yeah. this amount of days you need to have cash um you need to have you know a, a place to go and and all of that and mm -hmm. from an emergency management perspective and an EMS perspective you know healthcare coalitions can continue to drive that um that initiative of awareness and I think that it's I think that we are you know we continue to try to well I try to push us to the cusp of um making that next step and and it, to me and, and and us being at a time i think it just drives um more projects for you and ida team up on mm -hmm. I think 
I think I'll take offline my conversation with Melissa Rose in, in Ohio um, and, and bring you into that because we're talking about um, doing a, um, a series of exercises where we've got rural evacuation versus urban evacuation versus suburban evacuation and the different the different configurations of response that it would take to meet the needs of the populations during you know large scale events and getting back to you know with EMS resources at the scene um, and not at your hospital. Um, how do we manage that? And I was looking for while you were talking, I was looking for a graphic that I created, um, and I'll send it to you when I find it. But I created okay. a graphic about um, the fire truck going this way and that way. And the police car going this way and that way, and the ambulance going this way, this way, and this way, um, and then out doing the decompression. So they're, you know, they're going to the scene, they're taking the patients off the scene, they're going to the multiple hospitals, and then they're going to the hospitals to relocate those patients to specialty centers and stuff like that. Where you know the fire, I always say the firemen have it easy um, because they go to the fire and put it out and go home. Um, and you know the EMS guys, you know, we that just getting to the scene is the start of a, of a, a complex web of activities. That yeah. Occur. So sure. um, final thoughts. Um, I just want to thank you for your time. I'm getting oh, texts and you. messaging about this was a great fireside chat. Um, I really wish I could have got you here for the conference, but maybe next year. Yeah, um, I would love to. I'd love to come meet everybody in person. You know, I, this, this stuff is I think all the things that you guys are doing are, are important. And, you know, I, and, and even though, you know, sometimes you don't have that perspective um, as you're kind of going through the daily grind, but the, fa the fact that you have that many people together working on challenging problems, I think you, you're set up for, you know, making some, some good headway on solving some of those issues. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep tapping people like you, um, who are on the front lines constantly. And again, James, thank you so much for, for taking the time out. I know you're busy. Um, and uh, that was an honor. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I know I'll you see too. you on Thursday um, yep. at, the, at the public meeting. And hopefully I won't stutter my way through that. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll go. So um, if anybody has any questions uh, and emails me, I'll send them over to you. Okay. And as soon as I find that graphic, I'll I'll shoot it over to you because it's just I think you can use it in in creating it as a basis for argument that EMS has a way bigger role and maybe not you know get back in getting back to the tarps. We may not have time to set the pretty green, yellow, and red tarps up. Um, so we need a better model. We need a better way to do things. So got to be surfers. Yep. And it's funny because one of the things that I always I, I say all the time is I use the ocean. Um, I use swimming in the ocean as a model, and there's there's three there's three things you can do. You can either dive into the wave and take on the next one. You could ride the wave to shore. You can stand there and do nothing and get smacked down and get sand in your shorts. Um, and that you know, and it, so it's 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 interesting to see um, that other people are thinking the same thing about uh, about the way you know decision making uh, comes down. So. Again, thanks much, James, and uh, you know we'll stay in touch for sure. And for my EMS colleagues, you know, to your point, Greg, about not getting invited to the table or feeling, um, you know, unwelcome. My advice to you is kick the damn door in and jump up <laughs> on the table because you have a role in this and you have a stake and you have to you have a constituency that you got to serve. And if you're not part of the conversation, as my other friend used to say. If you're not at, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. And <laughs> so so kick the damn door in and jump up on the table and and say your piece. Sounds good. And the door is always open for EMS and, and our emergency management partners. Um, awesome. And, um, we will um, we'll chat again soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, all your time. Take care, everyone. Thank you for having me, Greg. Thanks for being there.